Hello everybody. Here we will be discussing about the ventilatory strategy in the acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So here the heart fails to act as a pump. It could be due to systolic or diastolic heart failure. That would not make much difference. And how we distinguish it from ARDS is the history and the pro-BNP levels. Although they can be elevated in so many more conditions. But if they are normal, then it probably rules out heart failure. And how do these patients present to us? More accurate presentation, something which is happening for a few minutes or hours. They are hypoxic, they are restless, they have an increased sympathetic drive. So they may be perspiring, tachycardic, anxious, and they are conscious. And this is how we meet the patient in the ICU. And what is the ongoing problem? Myocardial injury. Because of the cause, maybe. Uh, myocardial ischemia which is ongoing or because of a diseased heart which is under great stress now increase oxygen demands because the lungs are now flooded you need more effort to deliver oxygen and this effort at breathing increases the oxygen needs of the body and causes more myocardial stress and the other problem is effort now the effort we make at breathing in pulmonary edema is much greater than we do normally. So there are greater drops in the transpulmonary pressure. So the thorax is trying to expand outwards with greater pressure and the heart is trying to contract inwards. So the transmural pressures become very unfavorable. And this can lead to further myocardial oxygen needs and myocardial injury. We got to take care of all these. And we have to act within minutes, unlike in ARDS, where probably we we'll, might be a little slower. Because here, the concerns are that the heart muscles may die, there could be irreversible injury, and they are also prone to sudden cardiac death. And the decision is to ventilate. What do we choose from? Non-invasive or invasive? If you look at the indications for non-invasive ventilation, this is class 1. So on the go, use it. And what do we need from our mechanical ventilation? Mainly the P. And sometimes it's just the P. So you find a lot of reference about the use of CPAP, that is a single positive pressure all throughout the ventilation to tackle pulmonary edema. And how does this PEEP help? We had discussed that PEEP improves the left ventricular contractility by improving the transmural pressures as we discussed. And PEEP also recruits the alveoli, helps in oxygenation, clears the pulmonary edema. You might add a little bit of support over PEEP if you need, but we need to understand that the major benefit would be from the application of the positive pressure. And to decrease the overall pressures, we might just choose to give CPAP. What is the problem with NIV in these patients? They may not tolerate. They are really hypoxic, restless, and you put a mask against their face with positive pressure blowing, they may not tolerate it. They may feel claustrophobic. They want more air to be delivered and the mask doesn't give you that feel. And what this does is, it makes them more restless. The sympathetic drive worsens. The oxygen needs increases. And the myocardial injury worsens. So there were a lot of concerns and papers on worse outcomes in my acute myocardial ischemia with the use of NIV and probably that was because of the wrong selection of patients because otherwise there is not much to choose between invasive and non-invasive ventilation and you cannot sedate this patient. So the advantage of NIV, an awake patient can now be a disadvantage and do not use sedatives to facilitate NIV in such patients. Your sensorium is one thing that you should keep track because they are hypoxic. The airways may become very difficult to track and best not to use any kind of sedatives to make the patient comfortable on NIV. So if you are fighting these issues, it's time to go to invasive and make the decision fast because otherwise there could be worsening of the myocardial function. What are the concerns with the invasive modes of ventilation? Great, you can paralyze the patient, you can sedate the patient, you know the restlessness decreases, you can give 
as much PEEP as you need, 100% oxygenation, so the hypoxia improves, the sympathetic drive is taken away, the patient is no longer conscious, so you don't need to keep fighting with the patient. Sometimes, when we take this away, the sympathetic drive away, the patient go into hypertension, bradycardia, and that is what is the major concern, the peri-intubation period. Now consider a patient who came very conscious to the ICU, he was breathless, you choose to invasively ventilate the patient, and he dies within the next 5 to 10 minutes, or oh, it feels very bad, and I think we have a terrible inhibition to invasively ventilate patients when they are conscious, it's very easy to do it in a knocked off patient. So it is very important that you invasively ventilate them whenever you appropriately explain it to the family or the attendant that something can go wrong, it can really go wrong. That is the only concern. Otherwise, the ventilator need for them, the need for positive pressure is generally for a much smaller time. So maybe you can get them out of the ventilator in a day or two. Reversal is very, very fast and that is also one thing which distinguishes cardiogenic from non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. How it behaves. You have tremendous improvement in the hypoxia. And that is why there is not much to choose between NIV and invasive. Anything which acts fast, reduces the myocardial injury is the best mode. Make your own clinical decisions. But do not make delays. And if the patient is already scheduled for a procedure, like an angioplasty, then there's no point choosing NIV as a mode. It's best to uh, invasively ventilate them, control the hemodynamics better, get them through the procedure, and sometimes you can actually extubate them and put them on NIV later, especially if they have severe systolic dysfunction. In some patients, maybe you also use high flow nasal oxygen therapy because it provides a lot of humidified and heated oxygen and it can give you a modest amount of P, maybe around 4 centimeters of water or so. So those are the mild kind of patients, maybe as initial therapy does not tolerate an IV and you just want to buy a few minutes, maybe you can try. But as I said, the decisions should come very fast. You should not waste time in deciding what is to be done. And make sure that you reverse the clinical condition fast. That is the whole idea of mechanically ventilating them.